welcome everyone back to CUHK Law and Directions in Legal Education 2020. Um, it's our, our third, our final keynote. Uh, and of course, it's, it's Geraint Hales, who you've, you've just been listening to in the big debate. Uh, those of you who are with us for the, the big debate. So uh, he's already been introduced, but I'll give you another brief introduction. Um, Professor Geraint Howes is Professor of Commercial Law at the University of Manchester. Uh, he's also Associate Dean for Internationalization for the Humanities Faculty. Of course, he was previously Chair Professor of Commercial Law and Dean of the Law School at the City University of Hong Kong. Um, he's former President of the International Association of Consumer Law, and he's held chairs at Sheffield, Lancaster, and Manchester, and has been Head of Law Schools at Lancaster and Manchester. Uh, he's been a barrister uh, in London and his books, well, he's got a number of books covering various areas, uh, uh, comparative product liability, consumer product safety, consumer protection law, EC consumer uh, law, product liability, etc. Um, so various uh, publications and numerous publications and books. Um, actually, on his, uh, his CV passed on to us, he didn't mention one of the highlights, of course. He's also been a speaker at the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series as well, so we should emphasize <laughs> that. Um, he also, uh, I suppose this is one of the benefits of the virus, he also supports, I think, the, uh, the international rugby team that's still first in the rankings at present, isn't it? Because there hasn't been any more international games, so I think that's the other thing to remember. Um, Geraint has been a, a, a personal friend for a number of years, was out in Hong Kong and uh, of course um, a lot of interaction with a lot of us out here in Hong Kong. So it will be very interesting to hear what he's got to say um, about uh, the future of legal education and particularly because of his uh, understanding of legal education uh, in a number of ju uh, jurisdictions. So Geraint, over to you. Well thank you Steve, that's a very kind and generous introduction um can you can you hear me and see me okay because i froze on my own screen yep i can see you yep i'm pleased to be invited oh oh you, you, you've got the video running sorry can we can we turn the video off whoever's in charge yeah excellent that's it let's stay we'll stay with the live garen i think would be better yeah i i, I was really getting worried then because they decided not to put my tie on and i thought somebody thought they um <laughs> they dressed me up for the occasion uh, but it is great to be uh, back in Hong Kong, even if it is virtually in Hong Kong. It's great to be with uh, friends. Um, I was due to be in Hong Kong three times this year, and I only made it for 12 hours. But in that 12 hours, uh, Stephen Lutz uh, took me out to dinner, which I very much enjoyed and allowed me to prepare a little bit for this conference. And it's great to see on my screen just below me, Daniel Pasco, my uh, sadly former colleague uh, now from uh, City University. So. That's also great that there's representatives of the other universities at this conference in Hong Kong. And that will feed back into a point I'm going to make later. But I'm really uh, pleased to be here. And I got to say at the outset, um, I have a strong emotional attachment to Hong Kong and the city where I enjoyed over five years as the Dean of City University. And if you just allow me one moment uh, of personal reminiscence, I still remember the last morning uh, as I was uh, going for my last jog along the promenade at TST um, and being very happy and reflecting about the joy I'd had over those five years and the wonderful experiences and the people I'd met and the things we'd achieved at City U. Um, but also really a, a great sense of sadness at leaving the city. Actually, a, a Frequent comment I've had since then is, uh, you must have been glad to leave when you did, and uh, did you did you have any foresight as to what was happening? Well, actually, no. I planned to leave uh, two years previously, and in fact, my initial thoughts for most of this year have been of guilt at leaving behind the people I cared about uh, in the face of the protests and the COVID, and wanting to be with them and to support my law school and my friends and colleagues um, that I left behind, but. I am pleased to see that, at least on the COVID front, Hong Kong's getting better. And actually, uh, I'd probably rather be in Hong Kong now than in the UK, because at least you can go out for a meal uh, there, which we can't yet do here. But maybe next month, things will improve. But I say all that, not just because I want to reminisce about Hong Kong and tell you how much I love and care about the place, but um, because 10 months on from leaving Hong Kong, I really do feel a little bit like yesterday's man. Uh, I'd have felt that anyway, I think, um, 
but you've gone through so much. I, I love the quote in the big debate earlier about a decade of experience compressed into just a few months. You know, all these challenges, which by themselves would be major challenges, economic, political, uh, public health. Um, if they'd happened once every three years, we'd still have had a tumultuous decade. And yet they've all happened in this very short space of time. Um, and I think you, what I've picked up is that the law schools in Hong Kong, and I guess the universities in general, um, have faced up to these challenges of teaching and they've done it with speed, innovation and ingenuity. And I think you're leading the way. I actually think we should pay more attention to what's gone in Hong Kong because you really have been trailblazers. And already from this morning's discussion, I'm thinking about things I can feed through to my university to make sure that our experience is uh, the very best it can be. And I think we're going to have more to learn from one another about how we've responded. And so the theme of this conference is, is really uh, excellent. And we already mentioned um, the conferences um, that you've, you, you, you've held. The numbers attending those seminars are just staggering. Some of them, I understand over a thousand people uh, uh, tuning in for lunchtime sessions. It's sort of it's something that we could never have dreamed of as educators that we'll be able to reach out to so many people. So I really um, applaud the way you've done that. Uh, I've myself used um, this in, in various ways. I, I've taught online at City University and in Switzerland and in Manchester. I've run research groups already about the COVID uh, problems online. And uh, I, even next week, I'm speaking uh, at a university in Malaysia. And I probably would never have been able to go out to Malaysia just for a one hour lecture. Um, but uh, we can do this virtually. And I think that's, that's a great um, advantage of, of we we're taking this. So I think having now said all that, um, I, there's a risk that what I'm gonna say uh, is out of touch because you've moved on so much from where I was uh, just last summer in Hong Kong. Um, but I hope that some of my comments will still be relevant. And also, there's also a danger, I think, of me being idealistic and talking from the side. And people might well criticise me for uh, talking about things which should happen now when they might say, why didn't you do them yourself when you're in Hong Kong? My only reply to that is that um, you can only do so many things. And uh, this is perhaps an agenda I'm going to set for the future. Um, but I know you're very fortunate to have great deans in Hong Kong now. Lutz is a very good personal friend of mine. I know a great and enthusiastic educator. Cheng Han Tan has taken over for me at City U and I know has great plans to take that law school forward. And uh, uh, at the moment, uh, Fu Waling is the dean at Einstein at Hong Kong U and also a really great scholar and uh, leader there. So I think we've got um, people who have their own ideas about legal education, but perhaps I've got a certain advantage in that as I'm not tied to any one institution now and I'm not bound to um, a, 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 any particular uh, agenda for the city apart from my own thoughts about it um, that uh, you will think that that gives me a certain freedom to to talk about issues and to um, say things which are perhaps relevant to the wider uh, legal education community in Hong Kong. Having said that uh, I do have a very strong commitment to my law school, uh, my old law school, City University. Um, I'm very proud of it and, and, and I really care for what is still happening there. Uh, and Manchester itself has a very strong university level strategic partnership with CUHK. They're one of our main global partners and also strong linked to Hong Kong U. So at the moment, I still feel that I'm part of the Hong Kong legal community and I want to just give uh, perhaps three uh, themes to my talk. One, and I think this is perhaps the one I can talk most authoritatively about, is that we should have uh, confidence in the quality of Hong Kong legal education. And from that, I think certain ideas will flow. Equally, I think that um, 
and this is this is perhaps my most practical point. There needs to be uh, more collaboration within Hong Kong and with Hong Kong and the outside world. And finally, um, that we need to take, and I still say we uh, take advantage of being part of China for the educational opportunities that gives us. So first of all, this is something that when you say we're inside the system, it sounds like you're you're beating your own drum. But from the outside, um, I think it's a very legitimate point to make that Hong Kong should be very proud that it has three law schools that can all claim to be ranked in the top 50 in the world. Rankings go up and down, but I've not seen uh, any of the law schools ever outside the top 100, and normally they're in the top 50. Now, that is truly remarkable for a city of Hong Kong size, and particularly when you think about uh, the major uh, law schools in the world, dominated, of course, by uh, the UK and the US and, and some in Australia. Uh, but, you know, that we, we have so many strong law schools in Hong Kong. And we ought to really be saying to the world, look, this is an amazing place. I think perhaps only London and New York could go anywhere near competing with that. Maybe other cities will jump up and say otherwise. But, um, you know, it, it, it truly is a remarkable strength. And yet, and this often irked me when I was in Hong Kong and surprised me to some extent. Many people would tell me um, that they thought that even quite moderate quality overseas universities were superior to local institutions. And I always thought that the major competition for the Hong Kong law schools was not themselves, but it was about persuading people that actually Hong Kong had the ability to deliver world-class education that was at least as good as uh, that offered overseas. Now, of course, I appreciate that there's advantages to studying overseas. Um, Hong Kong students want to spread their, spread their wings and spend time overseas, uh, taking advantage of going to study in great universities in great cities like my own in Manchester. It's clearly something which has uh, a distinct advantage. And when I talked to practitioners, they often said that they did want students to have that overseas experience uh, to develop them, to round them off. But I think probably, particularly for law, there are real advantages to study in Hong Kong. Um, the overseas universities um, and the students who study there do struggle to take these conversion courses to come back. And actually, it probably is better to be studying Hong Kong law, even if it is almost like English law in some areas. Uh, but in other areas, it's, it's really very different. And so I think, you know, in law in particular, there's a sense in studying it around. And also, um, the in law, because of the importance of contacts of professions and the internships and so forth, that's another clear, distinct advantage to studying in Hong Kong. And I was actually um, thinking about the student, I think it was Jenny in the last session, who said that one of the reasons she was missing being in a university group was the network in which she hoped to carry on through her career. And that does happen in Hong Kong. When I met my alumni groups, they 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 often met up and used that network to to uh, share experiences and, and knowledge. Um, it perhaps happens less in the UK. In the UK, I think um, people often study in one place and then move to another city for their, their jobs. And so th there's a dispersal of the alumni. Um, many, of course, go to London, so there may be networks there, but they often get into wider network groups. and that bond isn't quite as strong. But if, you're, if you've got a very strong local bond, it's a big advantage over somebody who's coming from overseas and then um, having to uh, get into that community from the outside. Of course, the PCL helps with that to some extent. Um, but I suppose what I'm really saying is, is a bit of a pitch that the, the best model might be a combination of both. It might be that um, studying at a Hong Kong law school but with some time spent overseas uh, is the ideal solution. And I think in Hong Kong, you've got four-year degrees, which give you this flexibility. And 
Um, I also think one of the consequences of the pandemic might be the development of more such collaborative, collaborative programs. Um, I think there is clearly a lot of concern at the moment about how many students will actually want to study overseas. Um, the predictions are all over the place, to be honest. Um, but I think if people are in collaborative programs, they'll be more secure and um, uh, willing to take that chance because they'll be in a, a structure. And so I think uh, for me, um, convincing Hong, good Hong Kong students, the best place to study law is in Hong Kong is a big challenge for our local law schools. Uh, but there are reasons which you can use, I think, to prove that it is the right choice, particularly if combined with um, some overseas, some meaningful, deep overseas experience. Connected to this idea of connection with the profession, I got to say one thing I really was struck about in Hong Kong was the, the talent of the local legal community and in particular, the willingness to devote time to the law schools. Um, they were willing to act as tutors on courses, particularly on the PCLL, to uh, mentor our students, to provide career advice, um, and to give students opportunities to partake of work experience. It is far easier, I think, for Hong Kong students to get work experience than it is for students in British universities. And again, that's another reason why the students, I think, should seriously think about uh, studying in Hong Kong for at least a, a substantial part of their degree. And I've got to say, the, the, the profession were also very generous in supporting the governance structures of the university. They're on our law faculty board, they're on our examination boards, and particularly involved in the PCL structure. And this is what I can never really understand. Given so much support and so much commitment from the profession, um, I really struggle to understand or to, <clears throat> to, to understand how it came to be that many, some people in the profession um, fell out with the university and in particular over legal education and the future of the PCLL. When I first arrived in Hong Kong, that was now six years ago, um, almost, um, the Law Society were showing their discontent with the PCLL. Um, of course, they first of all proposed a common entrance examination uh, before saying they're going to suspend that idea and propose instead a law society examination. And I understand now that both ideas are back on the table, but not to be implemented for at least a couple of years. But, and this is what I, I found hard. I never really understood what the concern was. Um, I suspect at heart it was the fact that to enter the PCL was very competitive and everybody seemed to know somebody for the makings of a good lawyer but fell short at this admission stage onto the PCL. And I got to admit, I met many people I felt sorry for in Hong Kong. Um, I met sons of colleagues who couldn't get on the PCL. Um, I met uh, young kids around the city who'd been students at CityU who weren't able to fulfill their career ambitions. And I suppose um, that one only has to feel sorry and sympathy for those people. I think my reaction to that was a bit influenced by my experience from the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, I'd seen so many people take courses like the legal practice course and pay a lot of money you know both in fees and in the cost of not earning money for that year and having to support themselves for that year and yet still not get training contracts at the end of that period um you know in reality if you didn't have an upper second it was very very difficult to get a training contract even if you passed the professional course and my my i think my feeling was that the people who didn't get onto the PCL would probably struggle to get jobs anywhere in the market. And we didn't really see that there was a, a big uh, unmet demand uh, that was would be served by having more people. So inevitably, and this is what I didn't understand, for the universities, it would be fine. If we'd increased the number of places and made more money out of these students, we would have been 
of course, uh, fine or perhaps criticised by society for taking money for people we couldn't uh, really deliver jobs to. Um, so it wasn't really that there was any self-interest in this. If, if anything, the self-interest would have been to increase the place in the PCL. But from my point of view, it was simply that um, I didn't want to open up places for people who would then not really have a realistic chance of employment in the market. And I didn't really see any problems of inconsistency between the programmes. Um, there might have been, um, and if the evidence of that would have been useful to see, but if there was, I think there were plenty of mechanisms, in, or there are plenty of mechanisms inside the system to remedy that. Uh, the professional involved in the examination process on the examination boards, many of the um, profession were serving for more than one university, and so they could clearly influence uh, the standards and the contents and so forth. So um, I, I, I don't. I, I don't think that could be really taken as a major concern that couldn't be remedied if there was a problem. I often heard that um, lawyers thought that people weren't properly prepared for practice. Now, I suspect again that some of this is just um, when we get a bit older, uh, we forget quite how naive we were when we were young. Um, and uh, I actually think the PCL probably uh, provide, produces students of a really well-prepared quality for um, going into the profession. And certainly I've not heard anybody suggest there should be a tougher process in the PCLL. I don't think anyone's saying that the new examination, the new procedure should be uh, stricter and tougher than the PCLL. So I really am a bit perplexed as to what is wrong or what couldn't be fixed by simply reviewing uh, the PCL process. And in fact, um, this is one area where I think the Hong Kong should really be, again, saying how high the quality of its legal education is. Just like it should be saying, we've got three of the best law schools in the world. They should be saying, we've also got the best way or the best education system for students. Four years or a JD plus um, a full year uh, training on the PCL in practical skills. Now, the UK is jettisoning its equivalent, the legal practice course. It's doing something called the SCUI procedure. Now, I'm not an expert on this. But what I understand that it involves is the need to have a degree, but not necessarily in law, and then to pass a multiple choice examination to be admitted into your training stage. And then at the end of the training stage, you've got to show that you've met uh, in, a, in, a, in a practical setting uh, the, the skills of a lawyer. Now, just imagine what the lawyers who are today are perhaps saying our students aren't fully prepared for practice after a year of the PCL. What would they think about the preparation of those who've come in through this uh, alternative SCUI procedure? And what um, a burden will be on the firms then to train up in the practical skills uh, the lawyers that they're having under their control. So I think uh, Hong Kong should be shouting to the world that it is, I think, the only one that would be requiring a full year of practical legal training before entering the apprenticeship or the training stage. Um, so I think. Again, you know, don't knock what you've got, praise it. Um, don't imply they criticise the programme, just say, actually, we are maintaining high standards. Um, and I think, to some extent, we took the edge off the criticisms because we did um, increase the numbers on the PCL programmes. We had more flexible procedures to take account of practical legal experience. And of course, I think there should be alternatives. Um, alternative routes into the profession. Um, myself, I was always very keen to see that people who'd entered um, as paralegals, legal executives, which many people did um, after um, a law degree who didn't get into the PCLL, that these people, when they gain practical experience, should have a route in. That could either be through the more um, 
flexible emissions procedures, or even I'd be more radical and say there should be a, a clear apprenticeship or legal executive route into the profession. Um, but it's a shame that these issues haven't yet been resolved in a consensual manner. Uh, students have been now um, about to start a law degree and uncertain about how to qualify for several years. Um, the government, the Standing Committee on Legal Education commissioned a report on legal education. And it's a real shame that that wasn't a forum for all parties to engage actively with the benefit of outside experts um, to uh, produce what we think is the best solution. Personally, uh, and I guess colleagues on the PCL won't necessarily agree with me, um, I myself would prefer perhaps a slightly shorter PCL in the first instance to um, give students the basics to understand what they're going to see in practice and then have some uh, peer study later on or continue education to allow them to bring back into the classroom uh, discussion having seen at first hand how things actually work because I mean that would actually be the best of both worlds you'd have then um, students going into law firms who aren't too green but actually also being able to talk about things they find difficult in practice with their tutors rather than having to as they do that in the workplace so i've said that we should um promote the law schools we should say how strong the legal education is and also i think the the, the, the teaching in Hong Kong, in my experience, was uh, of a very high standard. Um, the quality of academics keeps increasing. It gets better as some of us leave and others come in who are even stronger. Um, and I hope that the next uh, REE in Hong Kong will be evidence of the quality of scholarship across the board in Hong Kong. Of course, last time CUHK did very well. Um, and I hope that um, my own university will um, also shine this time. But let's see. Um, but I think what's important as well is that the teaching of Hong Kong meets the needs of Hong Kong uh, in terms of the courses offered and the programmes offered. Um, in my time, um, one of the things that struck me was how many locals did take our LLM programmes and we adapted to that by using um, evenings and weekends. Uh, in fact, um, I know that when some new colleagues turned up and they ended up teaching to 10 or 11 o'clock at night, they were quite shocked. And um, uh, that's a, a big difference with England, I must say, where it's very hard to get anywhere to teach after five o'clock and probably wouldn't be allowed, to be honest. Um, so um, the that, that teaching to meet the needs of Hong Kong, as a point I'll come back to again later, is is very important um, and I think it can become easier with some of the developments we were talking about earlier the use of different virtual learning options in terms of meeting the uh, ongoing needs of the profession through the LLM programs and so I think that's one area we've got a lot of excited opportunities and I'll come back to some of them later as well and I also think uh, Hong Kong is still teaching in a way that makes students and prepares them well for the profession. This is a theme that um, I want to do more research on. In fact, it was the initial theme I suggested for today's talk, uh, but I'm quite glad I was given a different topic because I think I need more, more research on this. Um, but I think there's a, there's a real challenge for law schools to develop uh, teaching that meets the needs of the profession whilst at the same time uh, developing innovative research agendas. Now, I've got to say that my view is that the RE and the REF have done an awful lot for legal scholarship. Um, when I look at the, the quality of young research today, the work they're doing, it, it, it's far superior to what was done when I started out 30 years ago, when simply publishing was seen as research. And now people are saying publishing isn't research, research is publications which take ideas forward and uh, to develop the agenda and that's right and there's also been uh, a lot of what you might say social science style research in the law school 
um, which has affected um, the the nature of legal research. Uh, I mean, ac legal academics nowadays tend to come into it with a PhD, which wasn't actually the case when I started. Um, and also, I think the wider university uh, understands this new style sort of social science research uh, rather than uh, the research which more traditional legal academics do. Um, and so I understand why there's been a, a shift in the research focus to what you might say research about law rather than research on the substantive law itself. And so I think um, that this has spilled over in some parts of the world, even in some very august institutions, to the fact that the, the teaching that goes on in the classroom is quite removed from the needs of practice. Um, I actually don't think that's the case in Hong Kong. Uh, I think that uh, in Hong Kong, the, the classroom, uh, the way the students are taught is still uh, fit for purpose for both in, a, in an intellectual way developing our students, but also preparing them for the world of work. There are, of course, uh, ongoing debates about the curriculum. And of course, in Hong Kong, one, one recent move has been for criminal and civil procedure to move out of the first degree syllabus and into uh, the PCLL. Now you can have a lot of debates about how broad and narrow the syllabus should be. Um, the Australians favour, uh, like Hong Kong, a very broad uh, core. UK has always had a rather narrow idea of what's a core, maybe too narrow, but probably on the whole, I prefer a narrow core and then allow students to specialise uh, from those core principles. But again, what's important is that syllabus shouldn't be too prescriptive, as although the needs of the profession need to be taken into account, um, we also need to expose our students to the subjects in the realm with the historical, social, political and economic dimensions of law fully explored. But one other thing which I think is, is going to be crucial in the way forward is the pressure on the syllabus. And it goes back to this idea of getting students ready for the profession. Um, the, the profession are more and more demanding. You know, we talked before about our students after PCL ready to practice. I would say they should be ready to practice after the end of their training contract uh, without supervision, not at the start of it. But equally, um, people are trying to say that they have to be prepared in other ways. They have to be better versed in the ethics of law, but ethics of law is even said to be required to become a core part of the curriculum. Uh, legal technology um, is now seen as almost a prerequisite for anybody going to profession. Should they um, learn computer coding as part of the core law syllabus? Um, but what about also business skills, entrepreneurship? Uh, these are all seen now as not just useful things to have, but also core elements of being a lawyer. And how should we uh, deal with that? Again, here, I think Hong Kong is well placed to deal with some of these things because you've got the four year curriculum. Perhaps you need to be more inventive in how you use the, the non uh, core law errors of that four year curriculum and uh, the sort of, since you we call it gateway education, the non law part perhaps needs to be more geared around uh, these extra skills you think lawyers need to have to, to broaden them. But I think in other countries where it's a three or in some cases in England, even a two year law degree, there's just no space for these things. And again, I think you've got this opportunity to really make um, an outstanding contribution to legal education. So for all these reasons, I think you need to have confidence in the quality of what's going on in Hong Kong. I think it's uh, exceptional. Um, and I think uh, you also see the, the enthusiasm of the staff and students as well. You've got a really exciting mix out there which um, when you don't have it, you realise how good it is. But you've really got uh, a great mix of great committed staff, wonderful students and a profession that is behind you and willing to help those students on and committed to them. So I think um, I would say take advantage of that. So then moving on to my next point, promote collaboration. Um, this is perhaps one area that I think I should have perhaps done more on during my time. Uh, obviously there are reasons why it didn't happen but um, I think I think there's so many ways in which um, the law schools can collaborate to become stronger and I think my I'm driven here by my under, my underlying philosophy being 
that although I want my law school to be strong, I wanted City University to be the best possible law school it could be. Um, what's really important for Hong Kong is not whether any one of the law schools is better than the other, but whether Hong Kong is producing the best mix of legal education for its society and its its children and its its, its uh, future professionals. So that may be a bit idealistic. I know lots of things get in the way of co collaboration. Uh, competition is um, an issue. Um, we're often told we should collaborate and then at the same time we're, we're set against one of each other's co competitors and even internally we sometimes feel that. We feel uh, the law school down the road is, um, you know, I'm less likely to cooperate with that than one on the other side of the world. Um, and I also know that some of the issues are very practical about how would you sort out the money between the university if you do practical things and what's the what's the view of my university administration about collaboration uh, with the university down the road but actually if we could get those things right and i think we probably can um there's so much to be gained by collaboration some parts of the world is a lot better than others um i think holland has, has a very good tradition of collaboration with joint professorships um i was very struck uh, when i went to north carolina that students from North Carolina and Duke University were able to take options from each other's university. And uh, this was seen as mutually beneficial and making uh, those places stronger. So I think we can do more here. Um, we did, I think, have a very good start uh, when I came to Hong Kong. We had a, a wonderful joint conference on the Magna Carta. And I think that really should have um, gone on into future years. Um, I was um, very keen to support such initiatives, but sadly they didn't materialise. Um, there's some easy wins, I think. We could um, have rotating meetings for PhD students. I think the PhD community is one which could do with collaboration. And I know that actually many PhD students in Hong Kong do informally know um, their counterparts in the other universities uh, as well. Um, and I mean, at that level, it's quite important because it then allows Hong Kong to be seen as a really strong PhD community to go to because between the three law schools, there'll be um, enough mass to really give that feeling that there's people working in your area at your level that you can work with. There can be joint training programs between the three law schools. And I really think that, that that's, a, that's the low hanging fruit, really, to try and get, um, uh, you know, maybe just quarterly meetings of the PhD students, student seminars, student conferences, um, joint training programs. I mean, that, that, that sh that, that's the low-hanging fruit. Um, we also did, of course, have um, some joint events that continued. Um, there was a uh, very interesting annual event with three of the leading Chinese universities, um, Renmin, Xinhua, uh, and, and Peking, and the three Hong Kong law schools. And again, I think that could be built on to make it an even more important event and engage more people in the wider law schools in them. And also, I think this collaboration is needed nowadays uh, to target the really large research grants. It's quite interesting that in Hong Kong, um, law schools on the whole did quite well in getting research money uh, compared to the UK. The uh, research councils were um, fairly uh, open to law applications but in dealing with the central university the amounts we got were still relatively small and this is the i think one of the sad things i've learned that um what what, what gets the attention of the university administration are the big grants the ones which are and it also in a, in a way makes sense because they're, they're, they're the game changers which ones are are so big that you can really say there's something distinctive going on here and i think um that's again um something that the law schools should think about. Uh, I think, again, the business schools do this a lot better than law schools. They come together um, to um, promote in that way. So that's what they should do. And also, in a very practical sense, uh, I think uh, there are ways in which we can collaborate together uh, on certain programmes. I remember the first competition commissioner coming to see me, and I think he went to see probably all the law schools. And, you know, he said, you know, 
I don't know why the law schools don't come together and put on a program for competition law, like a competition law masters. Uh, you haven't got in any one law school enough people amassed to perhaps do that, but by cooperating, you could you could do it together. Now, I thought that was quite ironic that the competition commissioner was asking us to collaborate, but of course it makes sense and it's not anti-competitive if it's done for the right reasons in the right way. Another area where I think this might be useful, just off the top of my head, is, is maritime law. Um, I was sure at City University um, we could put on a maritime law programme which um, attracted students from the mainland because large numbers of mainland students were going overseas uh, to study maritime law and I thought we could put on as good a programme and it would be for their careers um, probably even better to be in Hong Kong where they might be looking for jobs in the future. Um, one of the challenges actually was to recruit sufficient staff in that area. Uh, and again, it's an area where the, the, the combined strength of the three law schools might come together and uh, put on a, between them a very attractive programme. And of course, this can happen in, in other niche areas. There may be small options. I don't know. I don't see whether legal history is a small option in CUHK. It is in many law schools. Uh, probably at CUHK has got large numbers because of the quality of the teaching. But there are, there are certainly niche subjects which... Um, law schools might struggle to justify to place on the syllabus, but if they're offered in the, across the board, they, they might work. And again, the, the physical proximity uh, allows that to be facilitated. Um, and I think, uh, you know, working online, again, makes sense. Um, you know, why don't the law schools come together and do a unit uh, that is put on using online materials between the three law schools, a third of the work, for putting the online materials on, and then each law school can do its own um, add-on face-to-face teaching. Why don't you use that ability? And of course, you know each other, uh, and so it should be able to work. Um, also, this is where I have a self-interest, um, there's a possibility to collaborate uh, outside Hong Kong. Uh, now that we're working digitally, uh, why don't we invite each other to give lectures on our courses? Um, why don't we produce materials together? Why don't we produce programs together? Um, and again, the law schools have got a lot to learn from the business schools. The business schools do this. You can get a business school from, I suspect, any of our major business schools in Hong Kong, which is also co-taught with leading business schools around the world. Why don't we do the same um, in the law schools. Um, so again, I think the idea of collaboration uh, between the law schools and by the law schools with, with major international partners is, is something I would say should be on the future agenda. Um, but I don't underestimate the, the practical difficulties of, of achieving that, um, not least because you're developing new procedures and there's a cost to that and many people might say they'll be happy to do it but the the administrative cost of making it work just put it onto the back burner so that's but i think that's um something i would think we should, there should, there's some easy ways to start off doing that and we should try to think about them my final point uh although it's a, it's a substantive one is about being part of China. Um, when I thought about Hong Kong and I thought about moving there, I, of course, knew that it was a major legal center with major commercial uh, law there. But also for me, as a comparative lawyer, it was about moving to one of the most exciting and fast moving parts of the world. Um, everybody wants to know about the Chinese legal system. And I should say also, um, for a comparative lawyer, the Asian region in, in general has got a lot of uh, depth of comparative analysis to, to be done there. But China in particular is the system that people want to know about. They want to try to understand it. They know it's going to be an important force in the world going forward. They know its legal system is in transition and change, and they want to learn more about it. Um, and I think Hong Kong's got an important uh, 
role to play in explaining Chinese law to common lawyers and the common lawyers to the common law to the Chinese. So at City University, um, we had a LLM in Chinese comparative law for many years. And over, over the years, we've produced many gifted local alumni who've risen up uh, to the very highest ranks in, in the Hong Kong legal world. And that's been, I think, a great advantage to the Hong Kong society to have that expertise in Chinese law and the ability to study it in Hong Kong uh, in, in English. And also, the other way around, we were very proud of the training we gave to uh, the Chinese students uh, who come uh, to study on the LLM and the JDs. And in particular, uh, we were very proud of our Chinese judges training program. And we really felt we were making an impact and doing something very positive uh, for the relationship between Hong Kong and China, and indeed uh, to promote um, some really talented people within the Chinese legal judiciary. But my point is the world wants to understand Chinese law and Hong Kong scholars are well placed to do that. Um, I think one reason why scholarship in Hong Kong has not moved away from being useful is because the empirical work that's been done has for the large part been about trying to understand what's happening in mainland China and explaining that to the rest of the world. It's a it's the information that people are really hungry for. Um, so I think that um, this research on the Chinese legal system is valuable for China itself. It's valuable for Hong Kong to understand it. But most importantly, I think it's a way in which Hong Kong scholars can um, be relevant to the wider legal community. Um, it's always a challenge, uh, you know, when you talk about scholarship and so forth, uh, where your focus should be. And one of the issues I think that, that was signposted in the past was uh, how do you make Hong Kong law relevant to the wider world? Why, why does somebody in the wider world want to read about Hong Kong law? Well, of course, there's very many ways you can do that, but actually, people ask that question less often when it's about Chinese law. So when you write about Chinese law, people automatically see the importance of it and allows you to have, I think, uh, a strong impact. Also, I do think we need to think about our students uh, and prepare them for the future. And it's undeniable, I suspect, and I, I doubt this has changed, I guess it's got even stronger, that business with mainland China will be a major part of the Hong Kong economy going forward. And we need to equip our students with the tools to work in that environment. That means both language, and I know that's an issue in Hong Kong, but you've really, I suspect if you wanna be in a commercial practice in Hong Kong as a local person, got to have um, great uh, Mandarin uh, to, 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 to make the grade. And I say that as somebody who lived in Hong Kong for five years and didn't get to speak any of the local languages, something I feel terribly embarrassed about, but I think um, those language skill sets are very important. And also um, some knowledge of the legal environment is, is, is important. Um, and I know at City U we developed, we revised our teacher Chinese law to give it more emphasis and developed courses in both private and public Chinese law. Now I gotta say, I had many wonderful experiences in mainland China and with Chinese scholars. And I've gotta say, I think the quality of mainland scholars is improving all the time and is absolutely amazing. Uh, some of the young people that are coming through there have, are producing work of really the highest quality. And so again, I think there's a lot of uh, to be gained by Hong Kong universities collaborating with these leading scholars in the mainland area. I was actually rather fortunate because I'm a commercial lawyer in fact, ironically, when I come back to the UK, I've taught more commercial law than I ever have in the past. Uh, but I was always in the broad private or commercial law area. Um, but um, and that was useful, actually, because it, it, it's rather uncontroversial uh, to talk about commercial law uh, in the Chinese context. But I was always very impressed with my public law colleagues who were able to have really high level uh, debates about um, potentially controversial issues but to place them into 
a legal uh, context and to diffuse the politics in those issues and to put a discerning legal eye on uh, these debates. I was actually very proud that universities could be neutral territories with people coming together for reason debates. And we had some uh, very difficult topics uh, that were the subject of, of conferences whilst I was in Hong Kong. But the law schools were able to be places where people from all perspectives were able to come and answer these questions in a very uh, legalistic and, and rational manner. Now, I suspect the context will get more challenging in the future, um, more testing. Uh, and I think, although the line between law and politics can be thin, I do hope that overt politics can be kept out of the law schools and that we can make a real contribution to the debate through uh, proper legal analysis. As I say, I think um, some of the issues facing Hong Kong at the moment are more complex than they've ever been. That's the reason why uh, the law school needs to be that forum for uh, sensible discussion debate. Uh, and of course, in that, it's going to be very important to maintain our academic freedoms to debate and challenge. And also, academics can be useful in monitoring the impact of laws and the use to which they're put. So protecting legal scholars so they can be uh, independent commentators on legal developments is going to be a vital function for our law schools going forward. So this was rather an emotional talk for me. I don't know how it's come across, but I hope you see I have a deep commitment to Hong Kong as a place and to um, the law schools in Hong Kong. And I say the law schools, I mean, obviously City University is a place very, very close to my heart. But I always wanted to make sure that legal education in Hong Kong was the winner from everything we did. Um, but it's for you now, I think, people who are in Hong Kong to grasp the future and to really have an excitement about making Hong Kong uh, the centre for legal education in Asia. And I think you can because you've got those three law schools. But use that combined strength to make sure the world sees you as the place in Asia to develop legal education. And also, don't be satisfied just being the best in Asia. Make sure that you're the best in the world and that your law schools um, are uh, able to be uh, judged by international standards at the very, very highest level. But I think you have got great law schools, uh, great students. Um, I was reminded that I, I was teaching by Zoom at City University before I gave some lectures, but the students then gave presentations which were truly outstanding. You've got a profession that supports you in so many practical ways and offers you the ability to engage with high level commercial practitioners, but also you're in a context where comparative law is easy to do uh, and gives you access to the vastly important Chinese legal system. I wish I was still on the ground working towards those goals, um, but I hope um, I can inspire you to be ambitious, uh, to, to get to the next level in terms of um, legal scholarship and education, because you've got all the ingredients there to make um, Hong Kong, well, it is already a major legal center, to make an even stronger legal center. And actually in difficult times, the strength of those institutions will be ever more important to the Hong Kong legal community. So um, I think it's um, a wonderful uh, time to be in Hong Kong. Really, the, the technology actually is a great way to allow you to collaborate internally, but also externally with the rest of the world. And I certainly know that um, from my position in the UK, Hong Kong is always one of the places that we want to work with and to uh, collaborate with. And I look forward to doing that both personally, institutionally, on many occasions in the future. And perhaps sometimes we'll still be allowed to meet in person. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Karen. And um, as, you, as you said before, um, uh, when you talk around things, it will 
take longer, but I'm very grateful that you took longer because of course you said such nice things about the law schools in Hong Kong and also about us as well. So thank you very much uh, for, for all you said. Um, and uh, of course, at the beginning, I forgot to say to everyone, can you um, uh, chat me in any questions if you have some? I've had a couple come in, but we've actually only got about five minutes left. So um, I just wanted to say, by the way, I was involved in the collaboration for the for the Magna Carta conference, and it was a great event. And I think you're quite right. You know, we've got we've got three very good law schools, and uh, do look abroad a lot for our collaborations. Maybe we should look a, a bit nearer to home as well. Many of the points that you raised, by the way, uh, and I put this down to the intelligent design of uh, of Michael Lauer in the in the program. Of course, you you've touched on a number of points that have already been touched on by our previous two keynotes. Professor Michael Martinek and, of course, Professor Richard Suskind. Uh, and, of course, the next panels coming on. We've got three very good next panels coming on. But, of course, the one that's on this link is on professionalism and employability. And uh, I can see that my colleague, Paul Mitchard, QC, has already got his camera on. I think he's raring to go now because you've touched a number of things that I think he wants to carry on with. In fact, uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the requirement for passing the new mandatory professional skills course for solicitors in England and Wales? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on it because I um, I, I just moved back to the UK. Um, I think the intention behind it was to um, make it easier for more people to qualify. Basically, uh, there was a bottleneck that people weren't getting uh, training contracts. And what the new system seems to do is to allow a lot a far wider range of experiences to be treated as professional training. So the idea is that you can uh, take a, a course which shows you have certain basic knowledge of the law and then get a wider range of uh, placements. Even uh, work placements in, in university time can count towards that period. Uh, and not all the ones have to be necessarily in, 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 in a, the same traditional manner as in the past. So. I think the idea was to sort of get around this bottleneck, but I, I am worried that actually um, it's hard to go into practice without a, some practical training. And I know that because I went to the bar for a route for academics where we didn't have to take the bar professional course. And I had to teach myself how to draft and how to be an advocate. And to be honest, um, you know, I would, I, would have, I would have been helped if I had a bit of guidance at the start. That's why I think there should be at least some training in the, in the initial stages. But well, it's interesting because I, I got the greyer news today uh, about the, and, and I hadn't realised that the, the courses for barristers are going online. I think, isn't it? There's a part one online and a part two online course as well. Right. So I think I, I mean a lot of this legal training in the UK now, if there is going to be any, a lot of it's going to be online. So yeah, it's, it's a very it's a very competitive market as well because I mean. I mean, university, law schools don't really know what they're going to do yet. I mean, some are going to ignore it and just say, we'll do a law degree and then it's up to you how you pass it. Some will uh, integrate it into their syllabus. Others will have it as an add-on course. So either it'll be a freebie, which then goes into our income stream, uh, or we'll offer it to students for a certain fee with a commercial provider to provide the training for that part of the prep for the course. Um, so it's all a bit up in the air, to be honest. Um, we, we we have to still see what happens. I thought it was interesting as well. You mentioned that point about um, the, the universities, how things have changed in the UK. Uh, a lot of it, of course, because there were all those graduates coming through, paying for these expensive courses and having no future at all in law. And there were the, and, right. and, and of course, we're going to be maybe revisiting that again a little bit later on because we've got that special discussion panel, legal, legal education in the US. And of course, in the USA, they've had that problem as well, haven't they? The law schools there have been heavily criticized uh, for, for just signing people up for law degrees with no future for them in legal practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the government's policy is clear. They want less people to study art subjects like law, more people to study science subjects and, and STEM subjects. But for some reason, the students don't, want to make that shift in the numbers that the government wants so they're still getting more people studying art subjects than there are clear jobs for after after that route's been taken well i can understand because law is the most interesting subject anyways it is definitely yeah, yeah. yeah we all agree anyway Garrett, thank you very much uh, we've come the, to the end of our allotted time so thank you for all of your contributions through the 
the conference. And thanks for getting up so early this morning to join us for the big debate and to give us this keynote speech. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Oh, thank you. There's, there's, there's a private question coming to me from Simon, which I'll reply on, online. Uh, but it's about um, learning from other disciplines. And I think, well, perhaps I could just say that obviously that's one thing that we need to do more of. Um, we need to think about. And I think actually we, we, we're doing that with the online at teaching now. We are actually, I think, having a lot more thought about how we teach and transfer practice from other disciplines over. Well, when you were talking about the business schools and everything else, I think, again, Paul and the uh, the professionalism and employability panel will probably be touching on those sorts of things as well. But that's yeah, we just it. So so we did a project last week and in those projects students did teamwork and that's something that law students very rarely do so i think yeah. we can learn lots of skills like that it's, it's one of the things that when we have our exit surveys the students always say you know um we'd like to do more teamwork although sometimes when we try and make them do more teamwork they don't want to do teamwork especially if they're assessed on teamwork there are always uh, sort of question marks about that but it's often something that i think law students say when they come out is we should be doing more as teams. We should be doing, you know, because we know when we go into legal practice, we'll be working often as a member of a team. So, yeah. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, Garen, and as I said, thank you.